Um, so first of all, thank you very much, Rona. Uh, thanks, Jane, and thanks, Tony, and all the guys at uh, AIG Tasmania uh, for organising the event. Uh, I don't know if I'll thank you for asking me to talk, but um, I am, and I actually think it's a great privilege, and thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to thank all the people who've contributed to this talk. They probably don't know that they have, but uh, there are quite a lot of people who have. Um, and I'd also like to just, you know, thank my company for giving the permission to, to um, use a couple of the examples that I'm, that I'm going to do in here. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm a geologist. I'm an exploration geologist. Uh, um, I'm actually of a, a slightly older vintage, I suppose, uh, than, than many of my peers. And that's um, through the various ways I've gone through my career. I guess the, the uh, interesting point about all of that is I'm, I'm definitely back and definitely at it. And um, I think the opportunity uh, that this uh, session presents is something where I can distill, uh, I guess, quite a lot of my several years in industry uh, down into something that's useful and it's useful for, for project geos. Uh, and, and these are the people at, 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 your, at your level. So without too much further ado, uh, I'd like to get on to my topic, which is, which is contractor management. Um, so really what we've been talking about uh, today is a lot of the technical stuff. Uh, and Tony did a great bit, there's an intro uh, right at the beginning of this session when we were talking about what does it really mean to be a project geologist and usually it means that you, you know, um, you're pretty good technically or you're definitely improving in that space, uh, that you've, you, you're recognised by your company as, as being, you know, pretty, pretty sound um, and that you're definitely capable of managing and getting your head around data sets and more complex geological problems. Uh, you've sort of mastered the basic data acquisition phase, you know, of your career and you really are in that stage of, of moving up. And some of you actually may even be in this position. You may have been project geologist for quite some time. So hopefully uh, nothing here will be, uh, will be too much of a surprise, but I hope there'll be things um, that will definitely be news to you. Um, so, but part of the role uh, in when you're a project geologist is really about uh, contractor management, um, and it's and it's also about just getting to grips with being more uh, aware of your projects and and the work that you propose in general. Um, so, really, um, what is contractor management? Um, well, this is going to take you through it. It's going to be, you know, fairly brief. There are actually lots and lots of elements to this, but these are the key ones that are really pertinent to you in your position now. Okay. Um, so what we're going to talk about is, you know, why do we need contractor management? I mean, obviously we have contractors. Most of us have contractors on our sites with with them all the time. Or, you know, what is this contractor management? Why are we doing this? I mean, and who are our contract partners? A lot of the time we, we work with people, we don't even know they're a contract partner, unless it's obvious, you know, unless it's a name on their shirt or a different insignia. We sometimes don't even know we can be working with contract partners and that, in fact, they might be a little bit more um, input that we need to give them. Um, and also, as a, you know, as a project geo and stepping up into your new role, um, what, what are the expectations of you in this role about contractor management? How, what part do you play in that? And, oops, and also, um, what, are, what are your responsibilities when it comes to this, you know, as, as defined by, you know, what your role, your boss sets you or, or what, what's required day to day? And there are some elements to that. You know, there's um, there's a cultural aspect to contractor management and the responsibilities you have. There's definitely a legal one, and that's for your company as as well as you. Um, uh, there's certainly a safety aspect of contractor management. And um, throughout all of these, I'll try and give you little examples to sort of, you know, these are situations mostly that you'll come across in your work daily, I think. And so I'll try and give you little examples so that as you're ticking along, you think, oh yeah, this is this is something uh, Shelley told me about. Hmm, I might be a bit aware of this and see if I can uh, improve it or, or or stop something heading off in a, in the wrong direction. And so, you know, we'll discuss these things. We'll have a bit of a summary and review, uh, and then ideally we'll um, we'll have a, um, some questions uh, and a discussion. So, contractor management and and why do we need it? It's actually really crucial. Um, and, and something, you know, you'll only just start to get your teeth into this space uh, as a project geo. The further you go up the management food chain, 
the more you'll become involved in this space. So when you're a senior geologist, uh, and definitely by the time you're, you know, superintendent or exploration manager, you will really be heavily involved in this space. But at the project level, um, there are certain things you just really need an understanding of, because if you do, uh, it will make uh, the results for, for, you know, not only the contractors that they, they're putting out, but also the, the results that you expect for your company for the work that they do, it will really improve them. And it'll stop a lot of friction and, and some problems that commonly occur on sites and that really don't have to. Um, so the major, um, I guess, reasons why we have contractor management and it, it all gets down to you know this thing this thing called a contract which is it's really to help uh, ensure that the work that was agreed between the contractor and and the company that you, you're working for uh, is being done and it's also to the standard which with both parties have agreed and that the conditions in that contract are, are being met uh, and there are some there are some signs that this is all progressing well that you've got successful contractor management uh, and this exists and you, and you know it exists because all these these little signs occur it's when parties uh, know their obligations onto the contract so that's very clear uh, and that the arrangements for service delivery um, are both uh, satisfactory to both you know you as the client and also to the, to the contract manager i.e the, the drillers for example don't feel that they've been um, totally squeezed on the, on the rate they're going to make money uh, and and you feel that the drilling quality of the sample is is good you know that that's an example of that there um, another example would be you could see ben, you know another reason why we do this is because um, there's definitely um, you seeing the benefits and the value for money uh, that's that's being delivered. That's another really good sign. Often, you know, nothing said about that. But if you were to stop and think, uh, uh, is a result good? Then that's a, a sign that you've got successful contractor management. Um, if the supplier is cooperative, engages with you, you know, you have good. Don't have to be always great, but it can be robust conversations, and that's another good sign that things are working well. If you're not having good conversations or if there's a lot of friction um, or a lot of disputes then there's there's usually a problem um, and it says there you know disputes are rare um, and then also and in terms of just contract management you know and con managing contractors on your site obviously it's coming back to this contract and it needs to be compliant and this is part of a, a legal perspective and I'm really not going to delve too much there but basically what it says is when you when you're doing the work or when that work's being done, if it was to get audited by someone in your company, you know the accounts department or anything, um, it would it would meet all the criteria and um, everything is being done you know in a compliant way, so with safety and also financially, um, and it's it's ticking all those boxes. And I guess the important thing for for you guys in many ways is is this little diagram that I've got here, this little Venn diagram, and I like. I like referring to this because I'm not sure if you could, if anyone can see my, hang on, I'll go to pointer options here. Hope people can see that. So, you know, I love using this because um, it's most relevant to people at this level. Whenever you're having work done, you've always got these three, three competing um, uh, factors, I suppose, to, to any work. You've got the cost of it. You've got how long it's going to take and you've got its quality. Uh, and I, I guess it shouldn't be a, a Venn diagram. It should probably actually be a, a, um, a triangle with one of these at each apex because the reality is there really is, you know, fantasy is this overlapping point in the middle. You are never going to get the perfect scenario. or It's going to be highly unlikely, maybe in, in, a, in a startup, a startup thing where it's new technology, where you're, where you're um, going to get a, a perfect overlap of how long it takes to do a job the cost it's going to take you and the quality because we all know that if you want it done really really fast and um, you want to keep that cost low then the quality is probably not going to be great so again just little things to think about there um, when you're thinking about managing contractors and how that's going in that space so anyway we'll, we'll progress along um, and I've got a little question for everyone. I'm not going to do polls, but I, I really want you to stop and think, you guys online. Uh, this is really pertinent to you and, and, you know, everyone's got a different size site, but stop and think for just half a minute. Who are your contract partners that you work with on a regular basis on site? So just who, who might those people be? 
or that group of people be? And you can see my little diagram there, you know, there's the, there's the work you've got there, that teamwork you're doing, and there's a whole lot of different hands, different people contributing towards that project, towards that team, and trying to get that work done in a really, in a really good way. So who are those people? And, you know, and, and they can be quite a lot, you know. Um, an example, and it really depends on the size of the company you work for, but it could be, you know, the client is, you know, is your contract partner or other geologists. If you're, you know, if you're working and you might be employed by the company, there might be other geologists you work, you know, who you work with and might be, might be labour hire. Geophysicists, that's a common one. They're very expensive and they're very specialised. Often they're contractors because companies cannot afford to hire their own. So they, you know, use them as consultants. You might have people in your field support team, your fieldies, um, your drill crews. First, first and obvious set of contractors that you work with day to day, day in, day out. And you form very strong relationships with those people too. Your earthworks crews, it could also be the people in the, in the Perth office or in your office if you're in other parts of Australia or, or overseas. You can know there's the office admin people, your accountants, your tenements manager, that's a, a big one. They're often outsourced, they, you know, contract partners. Lawyers, everybody. And I, and I guess my, my real point here is that um, anyone in your company can be a contract partner and you're really important to go and identify who is and think about, you know, if for someone is a contractor and they're working for you, they might have slightly different goals and slightly different uh, end result and expectations that you do as, you know, working for you and, and in your company. So, and we're talking about expert, ex Sorry, uh, they're talking about um, expectations here. Um, here you are, you're the geologist and you've gone, you beauty, I've just got my new role, I'm a project geologist, I'm, wow, okay, so what do I have to do in this role? Um, you know, what is the key component here in terms of, of contractor management? Um, and I think the key word here is, is project. At this role, you're not going to be doing too much of the nitty gritty to deal with contract negotiation or anything like that, or it's highly unlikely, unless you've also got a law degree. Um, most companies, uh, at, you know, at this level, you've, as I said, you've, you've taken a lot of the technical capabilities, but they're also usually wanting you to step up and, and managing some of those other site-based um, and operational things to do, with, to do with your project, usually. It might not be with other ones. And this is particularly so if you've got maybe a small company or a small operation, or you're just doing campaign work. And it might be you, maybe another geo at the same time, uh, and maybe a fieldie, and you'll you might go out with a drill crew, for example, and it will be you who's who's expected as the most senior person on site, perhaps, uh, to run things well and to manage how work's conducted. So I mean, these are things that you you know you consider when you know you're looking at your expectations on site. So the point here is you need to know your company's expectations so you can obviously deliver on them. But at the same time, you also need to be aware of your contractor's expectations, what, what they need from you to help, you know, facilitate things, uh, whether it's, hey, I need to know where uh, a water bore is so I can go and get water, or I need to know, um, you know, are there any zones in areas that I shouldn't be or shouldn't operate in? Are there any curfew rules? You know, these sort of things. You need to know these expectations, how they want, how you want them to conduct their work so that things flow the best. And I know this sounds, some of this sounds quite obvious, but at the same time, it's amazing how easily it's overlooked because people just assume that the other side, they know. So when we're talking about expert, um, expectations the important thing there is is role clarity and the big thing about role clarity is knowing um what you what your manager and what your your um, company expect from you to do in the role as a project geo um you know in some of the big companies in fact you'll probably have no engagement um, with a lot of this stuff that actually might be earthworks team not thoroughly run by all the field crews you you'll never get a look in uh you just sort of send them you know some drill holes somewhere uh and maybe if um if it's, you know, you've got a larger organisation, you may not even get that much input with the, with the junior geos. Maybe they maybe they run somewhere else. So you really need to know what the expectation is from your company and, and from the role. And if not, you need to go and you need to find out. So again, so that you deliver uh, obviously the best success you can for yourself and your project, but also for the company and, and 
also ultimately for, for your contract partner. Um, so, and again, what do you think about, what do you expect from the role? What do you think it should involve? And you should discuss these things with your manager um, and to make sure that they all align. Because just because you've got an idea in your head, yep, I need to go over here. Um, I think it should be like this. Discuss that with your manager. Make sure that that's aligned with, with what they require you to do. Uh, and don't really at this stage, I don't want to have 50 angry emails from everyone's senior geo after this. Uh, we're going, thanks, thanks so much. I've just had a, um, my jaw just run off and, and change everything. I'm not asking you to do that. What I'm asking you to do is if you're unsure or if you don't know, to make sure that you do find out so that that really helps facilitate your role in that contract manager process. Um, and then we've, as I said, we've thought about, well, hopefully you've thought about and sort of identified um, who your major contract or who your contract partners are on site. And then hopefully you're also thinking, or at least know intrinsically what they expect of you um, and what they need from you so that they can perform their roles well. Again, it's often you're that person who's a facilitator on site your your role now as a project geo often comes as a sort of a linchpin or a clutch plate if it was to transfer information from the you know the sort of the technical side uh to the to the sort of the data gathering side but you're the person in the middle who actually might hold a lot of that information and know where things are and being able to transfer that well and give direction well uh, is one of those key things that helps this process run really smoothly. All right, so um, responsibilities. Um, and this is, this is something that uh, a lot of people, they get to a certain stage uh, in their career. Uh, and, and, you know, you have certain responsibilities and you progress along or whether that's uh, in the technical space or, you know, and definitely the data gathering space, you're really good at um, look, you know, identifying the rocks, collecting really high quality data. I think one of the earlier um, sessions today focused on that. But um, when you start getting into the project geologist space, you all start also start getting into um, slightly different responsibilities and contractor management in, is one of those. Um, and we talked about, you know, knowing your expectations and what and your company's expectations, what they need from you from the role. Um, but at the, on the other half, it's like, what are you responsible for defining those, like those day to day tasks? It's also important that, you know, you have those down there. It might be now you have to do, you know, more reports or, you know, uh, collecting uh, different or assays a different way or doing something slightly different for this project. Again, these are all things that come under, you know, responsibilities. And sometimes this can be a little bit daunting, um, especially if we've had a group of people and you're used to working as part of a team and suddenly you're elevated to a project geologist and suddenly the responsibility falls all on you. That being said, there's a very clear difference between responsibility, which is getting on to the day-to-day -day tasks. Um, you know, I might, I might have a project geologist and their, you know, their job day to day is to go and um, check the rigs, you know, make sure the program's running smoothly, go out there and, and do their geological logging. But it's not their overall accountability for the whole program and maybe for the whole budget for all the site. That would still rest with their manager or even their manager's manager. So just because you're responsible for something doesn't mean you're ultimately accountable for it. And it also means you shouldn't have to worry about that. Again, finding that, that um, expectation and those clarifications around your role is really important there. So you don't go off worrying about something or thinking that you should be doing something that you don't have to, so that you're not reinventing the wheel or, or you know, getting in the way of your senior who's, who's got everything um, very well mapped out. There are some other factors here. Um, in terms of, you know, your responsibilities and, and again to your contract partners and for making, you know, things run smoothly. Um, one of them is the cultural aspect of how you engage with them uh, and, and the way your company engages with contractors, just full stop. Um, there's also just that, that legal side and, you know, ticking all those boxes and making sure that you're doing the right things from, from that standpoint, that legislative um, standpoint. And there's also um, the safety side and that 
in part goes with the legal side, but they're, they're slightly different. Now, one's more of a contractual side and the other one is the regulatory side as prescribed by the government or various state acts. And in there somewhere, I'm gonna give a couple of little examples of things that go well, or I've experienced previously, where things have, have gone really well. And also, um, a, a, you know, an example or two of things really haven't gone well. And maybe some cautionary notes of how I thought things could have been improved um, and, you know, see see if there's uh, ways that perhaps we could approach things differently, especially next time as, you know, as we learn from our mistakes. Okay. So elements of, of contract management. This is the cultural bit. This is the, um, I won't call it touchy-feely, but this is the, the more subtle side of things. And um, I guess it's something that, is intrinsic, you come into a culture, you come into a company, it's got its own culture. Uh, and sometimes it's not really obvious that, that you're sitting and behaving and doing, uh, and, and certainly, certainly behaving a certain way towards your fellow peers or, or your contractors. Um, but it's, um, it's definitely something that's very subtle, but you do need to be aware of it because a lot of how your company and how you conduct yourself culturally and engage with people has a really big impact, impact sorry, on how people uh, respond to you and, you know, and how eager they are to get, uh, you know, um, a task done or, or some work done and, and the standard, you know, that they're, that they're going to, to do it to. Um, so, We'll go back again to these, you know, standards and expectations, uh, you know, um, in this thing. Um, are you aware of, you know, the standard and expectations um, that you want from your contractor when you have them on site? Um, and it's really important at this stage that you're setting the groundwork so that when a contractor comes on board, um, you know, part of your part of the standards that you need to put out there uh, are, are what are what you need. Usually, there's a tender document and all these sort of things, and, and a contract that has a lot of this stuff um, outlined. But if there are more behavioural things, like you know, you know and and uh, you know, induction requirements, or, you know, or no, you've got to blow zeros when you come in uh, safety meetings at this time, and everyone has to attend. You need to make your contractor aware of all of those up front uh, and, and preferably before they mob to site um, so that they can meet those expectations of yours. You need to be there to welcome them on site, to set them up, you know, uh, and to get those inductions and everything done. So the, the key point here is you need to know uh, what you need out of your contractor. You need to know what the standards are and, and you need to be also open, you know, in case they've done it better somewhere else and they can show you some improvements. Um, you need to be able to communicate those standards really clearly and sometimes really frequently. Like, you know, you might need to do a, when you're doing your, your safety and your toolbox meetings every week, you need to include your, your contract partners and you definitely need to reinforce things that, that might be an issue on site or, or you just need to keep on top of. So there are certain standardised ways that you can communicate with and, you know, one of them, induction documents, inductions, um, clear direction sheets, so an example of that would be um, your, your drill requests or your drill documents. And I think most companies would do those. As a project geo, you're usually the one giving those out. You'd Once you've got, you know, for example, your drill crew all there and ready to go, you'd be able to hand, hand your drilling instruction to them. You'd walk them all the way through that. So they're aware of all the little salient points, um, you know, areas that they can go, areas they can't go, where they should draw water from, um, the way you'd like them to sample if there's any particular quirks, um, that sort of thing. So really clear instructions is absolutely key there because it gives your contract half a chance of first of all meeting them, uh, but even better, you know, exceeding your expectations. And I think um, Paul talked to him earlier, you know, on his talk about drilling is talk to, he was saying talk to the geologist. Well, I'm saying talk to your contract partner because they've obviously been around, most of them have been around, some of them have an amazing wealth of experience. So communicating with them is, is absolutely key. Uh, and on that communication, um, you know, there are various other ways um, of communicating. There are also sort of formal ways like the daily pre-starts, weekly client meetings, you know, uh, and, any, and anything like that. And decisions, you know, often there'll be meetings involving contract partners. Sometimes there'll be action items coming out of those, um, you know, or things that need to occur. They need to be documented. And then all the parties need to be included in those emails. So you're not running around 
saying, oh, so-and-so said this last week, but here we are in a meeting this week and it, and it hasn't happened or I didn't know it was meant to happen because I've just, I've just come in off, off break and I wasn't, I wasn't there at the last meeting. So again, all, that, all those standards that need to be communicated well, have open communication, make it available to your contract partners, you know, and make it available so they're comfortable to ask questions. That's another important thing. If they're never going to tell you if something's good or bad or not working, uh, if they don't feel comfortable to approach you. And we'll talk a little bit more about that culturally in a minute. Um, another thing about the work is that, uh, that, that your contractors and, of course, you are doing together because it's a partnership. You can't get your work done without them and they need you for direction, is that you need to be reviewing it and providing feedback. You know, constructive and robust feedback is, is the best sort. You don't just shouldn't be always giving, you know, great feedback with, with no details and you shouldn't always be giving negative feedback. You know, it should be constructive and you should be promoting that idea with your contractor that you're, you want to have those helpful, robust discussions. It doesn't actually matter that you don't necessarily all agree on a point. It's the fact that you're having those discussions and you're working towards a resolution if there is a problem. Or if it's a good discussion and you're getting feedback and, and ideally room for improvement and you're taking those on board. Those are the other sort of fantastic discussions. Um, but that comes out of reviewing progress, reviewing work, whether that's because you've compiled your data and you've gone, oh, wow, here I am. And I've just noticed that, you know, production's really up this week. Um, I'll go back and, you know, I'll, I'll, whether it means I talk to the Riggio, talk to the contractors and say, guys, that was great. I've looked at your core. It looks fantastic. Um, you know, good job. Is there anything particularly you're doing? You know, this sort of, these sort of discussions are really, really positive and really, really helpful. Um, I was going to say we've just we've just done a bit there of providing feedback and to your, your contract uh, to the contract partner, but also remember to give it to your manager. Um, your manager sometimes a step removed, uh, and they may not be aware of everything that's going on. They may not know the reasons why things are going on. They might just get a report every week, which you may give them, and all they see is you know production numbers are down, and they won't understand why. And and, that, and you know for some people the first. The first reaction is then to launch onto the phone and then launch into the tirade of, you know, you tell me why this contractor isn't doing X and Y and Z. Why is our production down? Um, it's really important to communicate early and communicate frequently with your manager as well as your contract partner this, um, the reasons why things might change. Uh, again, so there's no miscommunication and everyone's on the same page. And really important out of all of this is you need to be available. You can't communicate with everyone if you're not there. Um, and more to the point, your your geos, if you've got a team underneath you, can't be can't be communicated to, can't be told what's going on um, if they're not there. And that's why things like being on the rig and that cultural expectation, you know, uh, that that your that you set or your senior geo sets uh, is so important to be available to your contractor. And a little example here, and this was a this is a really good one that I get reminded of frequently. Is here you are, um, you know, you've you've got a driller, uh, sorry, you've got a rig. It's it's turning away. It's a diamond rig, and I think hopefully we've got people in the audience who've all of you maybe in the audience who've been in that situation. You're getting near the end of hole. and you know that it's you know the geo calls the end of hole. That's the expectation. You know that. And, and you're there and, you, and the contractor, you, you're doing the right thing. You know that, you know, you, you wait till the geo gets there and cans the hole. Except the geo doesn't come. The geo has forgotten about you or had got sidetracked doing something else. So you sit there and you do the right thing. You know, you've, you've reached the predicted end of hole uh, and um, still no geo. So you've made phone calls and, you know, have done the right thing. Eventually, you've actually called that geo's boss. The geo's bosses realise something's wrong and said, yeah, don't worry, I'll, I'll send someone down to can the hole. Anyway, four hours later, the geologist comes out and they can the hole for you. Um, realistically, that should have happened and the geologist, you know, should have been there. Uh, there are some mitigating circumstances, obviously, but the geologist should have been available. Um, in that particular instance, you know, you're charged standby, active standby uh, at, at, at your active rate, whatever that is. Um, and all these things compound uh, and go culturally at least, as well as contractually, go to make things, go to make your cultural and operating environment just that little bit harder. If you're always you know, putting barriers or not paying attention and not 
being available and not looking after your contractors and also your own company and your own interests, you're making your own job and that of your contractor just that little bit harder. Because that four hours, apart from costing you, you know, quite a bit of money, could have also been spent for that drill company getting it all together, packing it up, moving on to the next hole and ultimately saving you even more time because, you know, they wouldn't have had to wait, for example, for, for the night shift or, or whatever else, not being able to move things. So all of this stuff can have a compounding effect. So if we look further into this and, we, you know, I was talking about the that mindset that, that that you have or your company might have and how you deal with, with contractors. Um, I've got a couple of little images over here on the side of, you know, how does how do you and how does your company, do you think, uh, look at your contract partners? And I've, I've got three examples here. Um, this big one up here, you've got, you've got company X. Um, imagine this is like a large company. You're possibly a multinational. Um, they don't have to be, but you're, you're quite a big company. Um, and basically you call all the shots. Um, you've got really strict times when your contractors can come in and do their onboarding, for example, which is good. You've got a lot of processes, you've got a lot of um, organisation, a lot of structure, which actually is, can be really good some ways because it's very clear often to, to contractors that come on um, what they're supposed to do. And here are, here are little contractors over here. Um, we've got um, company Y down here, and they're a lot smaller, you can see. Um, and the interesting thing about this is they're almost as small as the individual drill, you know, the individual, not drill contractors, but those as well, the individual contract partners that they may have. Imagine if it's a small junior exploration company here as Company Y and you've only ever got um, at the most, you know, four geos and a couple of field crew. Well, in fact, you, if you had a drilling company there, that they're almost the same size as you. Um, interesting, I suppose, culturally, I guess the point I'm trying to make here, and it's it's not always the case, but Company X, might, you know, is, calls all the shots. It says, you know, contractors, whoever whoever you are, wherever you are, geologist, whatever, geophysicist, um, we want you here at this time. And, and usually, the, you know, the contractor has to, has to comply. They don't have a lot of leverage in that situation. And culturally, they're sort of outnumbered by the, the large cultural footprint, I suppose, of Company X and the way that, you know, everyone sort of operates subtly in that company. Company Y is a bit different. You can see it's, you know, the culture in that company is probably largely driven by the individual, uh, you know, whoever that is. And, and if you're the project geologist in that team, the culture to some extent is really driven by you. So, you know, keep that in mind. You have an enormous effect there to affect a lot of change. Um, you can, and, but also, you also um, can be very affected by the contract partners you work with. And if you work with good ones, good ones, that's fabulous because you can gain a whole lot of support and a whole lot of learning from them. Uh, if you work with ones that have a little less care, that might not be such a positive thing. It can be a hard thing to wear day in, day out if it's, that effect is not absorbed by other, by other company members. And then we've got Company Z down here, and they're slightly different and they view their contract partners as slightly different. You'll see the other two have their, they view their contract partners as, you know, outside their organisation, very much outside. Company Z takes a slightly different approach, um, at least culturally anyway. Obviously, financially, that's a different story. But culturally, they view everyone as, as more of that one team approach, um, which is a very, very useful way to view everyone because then there's no, there's no difference between how at least you treat contract partners, at least on site. Um, so to go back to my, my points here, um, my questions were, how do you think, you know, you and your company engage with contract partners on site? And is, are there some really subtle cultural differences that maybe um, those of you who've moved companies before um, can think about as you've moved companies? Are, are there any cultural differences to the way one company you've worked with treats, treats your contract partners versus, versus, say, another one? And this is important because it often comes down to, as I said, an individual um, expression of culture and an individual, you know, evalu evaluation, I suppose, or, or care factor for, for the people you work with. Um, and if it's not for that, then things can, as I said, fall apart quite quickly or at least quite, quite difficult to manage. But there are some very subtle cultural differences between, between companies. I mean, my best example here is actually huge differences between culturally between drill crews and, and within that the larger between drill companies. So some companies have a, a very 
standoff. This is the way we do things and, and thank you very much for input, but we'll continue to do it this way. And other companies I've worked with are, yes, we're very happy to work with you. Oh, that's an interesting way of doing it. We never thought about doing that that way. Oh, we'll take that on board and we'll adapt it to, to suit how we, how we work. So again, subtle things. It's fine, but you'll just find that you have to mould yourself to working, working with your contract partners and to get them hopefully to mould a bit backwards and, and to work with you. Key thing here is treat all your contract partners with respect, mostly because most of them are experts in their field and you would not be employing them uh, otherwise. Because they're experts in the field, um, you expect them and, and also of yourself um, to have certain standards, whether it's, you know, usually it's for the quality of data that, that they put out or, or, or the task that they undertake. Um, and the key thing about your role in, in managing all of that is making sure that you're aware of that standard, but also you only accept a standard that you and your company are happy with. The one you walk past is the one you accept, I think is the saying there, and I've, I've got it there. Um, we talked about you need to set that standard early so that everyone's absolutely sure what that standard is. And if you see something wrong, you really need to speak up about it. Don't accept it. You know, and I realise that this can be quite difficult, uh, especially if, you, you know, a lot of project geos don't tend to be particularly old. They might be in their mid to late 20s. I realise that's no longer a thing anymore. But when I started, that was definitely the case. You were quite young and there were often, there was often you and, and maybe a fieldy, but then there could be a whole group of contractors over there with their own ideas on how things should be run. And it was quite intimidating, actually, to, to want to speak up and say, actually, that's not good enough. So the important thing there is if you're not comfortable, you need to go and seek support from your manager and, you know, don't accept second, second best. Uh, your manager wouldn't, I'm pretty sure, and, and, and you wouldn't either. And any good company, any, regardless of, of contracting status or otherwise, uh, should be in the same boat. Which gets us back to the fun bit, which is, which is the legal side of things. Um, I said before, you know, contractor management, comes down to ensuring that the the products you know the, the, that come out of of the tasks that you're doing are all being uh, done in a way that was agreed to under your contract uh, and that's really what this is all about um, it's that you know it's, well, it's usually several pages worth of documentation and it's got the opening bits and then it's got several schedules of rates and and schedules of standard that sort of thing but that's all been legally agreed to. Your company and their company have signed that off. So the, the people higher up in your office have, have made the commitment of this is what they want. And you're the lucky person basically doing the doing uh, or supervising some of the people doing the doing. So it's really important you have just a basic grasp of, of what this all means. Um, to do this, um, you need to be aware of what's going on and, and just to sort of have your head around the basic the basic key components and key fields within the contract um, and again make sure that you can communicate well enough at least with your contract partner to to know uh, if that's all going smoothly and and they're meeting those basic terms in the contract and you can see that they're meeting those basic terms or if or if things aren't um, so I guess the key point here is you should have copies of your contracts and they should be you know, available to you and for anyone who's working underneath you or with you um, who may need to supervise contractors as well. Um, so for example, that might mean your rig geos may need a, a copy of the contract. Um, caveat here, these are commercial and confidence documents. So you really limit their distribution. They're not to be bandied round and handed to the drill crew. They're not to be given to to anyone else outside your companies. It's a very, it's a privileged document. So again, a really big caveat on that, you, that, you know, you can get in serious trouble for, for forwarding those on. Again, they're only for your company only. So they're not to be, you know, rates and that aren't to be disclosed to others. Um, keeping an eye on on production, obviously, is one of the things that is really key to knowing where, you know, how well you're going. And the most obvious measure of that, which is which is really the go-to for all of this, uh, drill plots. Um, and I suspect 
pretty much everyone in the room has has dealt with a, a plot of one sort. It could actually may not be even a drill plot. It may even be earth moving contractors or or someone else. But they have a usually a daily written record of how much work or, or the quality or work that they've achieved for that for that particular time period. Um, I'm going to use a couple of examples of drill plots here because I think they unfortunately uh, still provide a, a myriad of examples of things that can go wrong, even when things are supposed to be going right. Um, the important thing for you as a project geo uh, is to either check these yourself when you're signing off or make sure that the geologist on the rig or the person who's your delegate is checking them off is checking them off daily, so not just leaving them all till the end of the week and then, you know, scribbling their name across them all, but um, also knows what they're looking at. Because it's really easy to just sort of nod, especially if you feel under pressure because there's someone standing here next to you shoving this book on your face or they might have emailed you this, this plot and said, come on, come on, we need you to sign it, hurry up. Uh, you know, my, my supervisor wants you to do this so we can continue on and, and send out the invoice. And the important thing is not to feel that pressure or try not to. Give yourself a little bit of space. Go through, check, check, you know, this this thing that you're being asked to sign um, and and know what you're actually signing. Because this is this is the formal record of what actually occurred. So if what's written on that plot is not what's occurred and you're pretty sure it's not, then don't sign it. Um, I've written here, it says the plods are the accurate and, um, you know, you know, they need, you need to ensure that they're accurate and you need to ensure that, that yourself or, or, you know, for example, if it's a plod, the geologist on the rig can verify and review, um, so verify that is an accurate uh, representation. Um, they need to be approved daily to make sure that nothing gets missed. And also because these things can escalate really quickly. You know, if there's an error that goes from day to day, they can compound really quickly and you don't want that to happen. I'll, I'll give you a really good example of that uh, in, the, in the next slide. Um, but for checking, you, you really need to be on the ball here. The, the, if it's a plod and if you're looking at um, what's occurred during that nay, the expectation really is that whoever's on the rig, whether it's yourself or, or the rig geo, should be keeping a little logbook. And whilst it might not be down to the minute, the, the geologist should be keeping an eye on the activities that are occurring and then cross-checking that with with the with the plods at the end of the day, uh, just to make sure that really is an accurate represent, representation of what occurred. Because ultimately, this is a this is a little legal sign off, and you're you're verifying that this work occurred, and that your company should pay should pay the money for it. So it has huge knock on effects. Um, I guess the main sticky issue out of all of these things is that sometimes a contractor will say, "Well, hang on, we've done this work." And, and why aren't you signing off on it? And you can you can feel an enormous amount of friction uh, and, and, and pressure sometimes to just hurry up and sign it. You know, all you have to do is sign it, just get on with it. Um, don't. All I'll say is, but don't panic about it either. If you just politely say, no, um, I need to go and review this and go and seek help from your, from your manager, from your senior, um, if you're unsure. But again, don't feel pressured into doing something. If if you're feeling like there's a lot of heat, I would really take these situations and move them onto your manager, who should who should take it, you know, up with their their office manager or or the contractor's manager. Try not to have these things boil over in the field if you can avoid it. Again, because you're the people in the field, you're trying to do your job and have it function day to day. If there are some of these things that need to be resolved higher up then I think you should feel very happy to just punch that one onto the senior. Again, no senior geo angry emails, please, after this. Feel, punch that one up to your boss and say, hey, having a problem, don't think I'm, I'm going to be resolving this here on site. Are you able to maybe take it up with, with company X, Y and Z's boss and have them resolve there? Uh, and I, I've put in point number three after this because, again, often this is a thing that geologists don't like having to deal with. And or find it uncomfortable to deal with, and and my point is this: it's um, it's the contractor's prerogative to to charge you for the work they've done. They're absolutely within their legal right to do that. If they've done work, then they can charge you for it. But it's also yours as the client to refuse to pay that charge if you feel that it's excludable in the contract, or if you feel that they really haven't done it to the standard and therefore excludable in the contract. So again, if you're not sure what that is, go and talk to your senior about it. But, but again, don't get worried about this either. Don't, don't think that you have to you know, approve everything that gets shoved under your nose. Review is the key there.
So talking at reviews, what I'd like to do now is quickly take you on to this little practical exercise um, that I've generated. And I do have permission to show this, but I have deleted out the names uh, of, of companies who, who shall remain nameless. What you can see here is, is a very honest effort by the drill crew to log all their holes with the correct meters and everything. Um, what actually happened though is something a little bit different. So there are some giveaways here. I won't let you stare there for hours and hours and hours trying to, trying to figure out what the problem is. You see there are some purple arrows and what you can see hopefully is a, is a date stamp up the top there. You can see one is the 8th of September last year and another one was the 10th of September. What you'll see, these are air core drilling plods, by the way. Um, what you'll see is there's a whole duplication. So somehow, miraculously, a hole's been drilled uh, on the 8th, and then two days later, it's been drilled again. Just let you look at that. What you may also notice, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll circle these so that no one's sitting and staring for too long, is that um, they've also suddenly, this same hole has with only two days in between or one day in between, suddenly added on a couple of extra metres. So it's gone from being 63 metres up to 85 metres. Um, problems like this uh, are less and less common now. Um, often with the advent, um, a lot of companies will use um, digital online plots, which will load straight into databases. Uh, and they'll have certain validation scripts in there that will prevent uh, duplication of holes and, and prevent also prevent things like uh, hole depths hole depths being um, extended past you know sampling depths and things like that. There'll be various things that if you're in a larger company uh, with a database administrator who's got this all under control, this stuff you know won't occur too frequently. But there are still the incidents where that doesn't occur, and there might just be a digital plod. I think they're all all digital now these days. Some for drilling companies maybe, some earthworks contractors and a lot of others, they still use a written form book. Um, so it's important that you check things like the date something's occurred. It's also important you um, you double check uh, where where the work was you know supposed to have been carried out because sometimes it's not always the, the person in charge who's filled out plot books. Sometimes it's the, the you know the younger people underneath them and they've simply copied and pasted or or they've simply just you know copied yesterday's or the day before's date over or information over to the next sheet. And of course, you might have moved areas entirely and, and you're no longer there. Uh, in this particular case, it was a bit more complex than that. Thankfully, we were in the same area, so I wasn't having to, to um, change everything. But um, it took a, a good few hours digging to actually resolve this. Annoyingly, both of these plods had been signed and approved. Uh, it was only when, when my database administrator got back to me and said, uh, there's a problem here that I had to dig back through it. It took me quite a few hours. Um, the problem occurred on the 8th, um, where we each one of those drill holes has actually been, been, been transposed by one. Uh, so in fact, the driller wasn't checking the hole number and he'd given different hole numbers in correct depths. That problem then carried through. So in fact, they never had drilled uh, that bottom hole there. Um, YMAC 02837. They actually hadn't drilled it, but they just you know assumed it with that because it was the next one in the sequence. Um, then what had happened is everyone had gone on shift change. So there was no drilling on the ninth, and quite a few people had, on the crew had flown out. So that when people came in on the 10th, um, they resumed drilling and they diligently drilled YMAC 2837 and they got to 85 metres and continued on from there. Um, it took a while, as I said, to unravel this, and because it had been, it hadn't been checked properly by the by the poor geo. Again, names have all been deleted to save the innocent. But the poor geo there, and the driller himself had not picked up on it, or his supervisor who had also approved this plot. Um, we were quite quite deep in the in the matrix, as my database administrator says, to unravel all of these and then back allocate holes to their correct date and correct depths. Um, the important thing is getting in early, knowing knowing what you're looking for. So looking at things like date, looking go even going back a plot or two sometimes, making sure that you've got those correct hole IDs. 
um, and that there's nothing strange going on uh, with your bottom of hold depths uh, are things that are really so important. So you won't have any problems later on or we limit those problems and then limit, you know, limit that time wastage. We had to go back and get the drilling company to change the plot and everything. It was quite a, quite a long and laborious process and I'd rather not do it again. Um, so now that we've talked a little bit about the contract, you know, those, those tricky um, plod things, we'll talk a little bit about safety because this also falls under that regulatory side. And this, I guess, in terms of the obvious things a lot of you would know about, you know, being a project geologist, having responsibility for this area is, is something that's, that many of you would think about. Um, and the considerations in here are, are quite varied, but they're also quite important. It just depends what your company requires you to do. This is not hard and fast, but they're general considerations and always good to keep in the back of your head of, okay, what, what safety wise should I be keeping an eye on here? Um, this slide is really not to do with um, talking about and reiterating the duty of care. Obviously you, you have one, you have a duty of care um, and you've obviously got a duty to act safely, stop others from acting unsafely. Uh, and again, that all comes back to, to communications, you know, um, and making sure that everyone on site is very much aware of your on-site procedures. You know, if, if you have a certain standard about how fast people can drive on your tracks, if you have a certain standard about whether people need to be in full wheel drive, you know, high full wheel drive when they're on your drill tracks like they are in some companies. All of this stuff should be communicated. Again, so your contract partner doesn't unwillingly um, and through no fault of their own breach your, your protocols. Um, but other areas of responsibility um, which are important for, you know, you guys to consider um, are these things like, as I said, inductions and making sure that your drill contractors are aware of all the rules as you know, either before ideally or as they come to site and that site specific induction, because you can't go pointing the finger and saying you did something wrong or you breached this procedure or that procedure if you haven't disclosed it to them. And that's pretty important. Um, and it doesn't matter how heavy handed your culture is and saying, you know, you point the finger at the con contractor and say, oh, well, you're supposed to know. That actually doesn't cut it. You are required to tell them what their responsibilities are and their obligations are safety wise on your site. Um, things that, you know, which are more on a day to day um, tasks that, that you might be required to do or, or the rig geo or the other person who's supervising um, contractor work might just be general inspections like uh, vehicle or plant inspections. And a really good example would be your, you know, your weekly or monthly drill rig audits that, that the geos do. You go in, it's a third set of eyes, a different set of eyes to the drill crew. And you just run your eye over things and make sure that, you know, the pads are clean, that the, you know, things aren't falling off the trucks too much, that, that sort of thing that, you know, everyone's wearing PPA, all that sort of thing. If you're um, the geologist who designed the program and you might be, you know, in that great position where you've, you've got that full suite of, of experience, you've just designed a program, you're there with the drill crew, you're going to go and drill your own rocks, drill your own theories. Um, one of the considerations of that is have you designed a safe drill program? Have you made sure that when you're asking people to go out and do that work for you, that you've considered and closed off on some of those issues? And some of it might be quite obvious and they're contained within your general site uh, risk assessments. So things like, if is it going to be hot? Are there going to be electrical storms? Those sort of things or flooding if you're in, you know, the northern part of Australia or other parts of the world. But there might be some really site specific stuff. And one of them might be example, is there, are there known intersections of fibrous material? You know, have you got a plan in place for those? Um, especially if your area, you know, is, is near something like that. Or have you, have you, you know, if you're drilling on the sides of hills, it's not so much a problem in the gold fields in Western Australia. But it could be a really big issue uh, for, for people in Tasmania, for example. Bits of Victoria are pretty, pretty scary. Um, and definitely parts of the Pilbara, if you're drilling on slopes, um, are your project designs, your pad designs good enough and safe enough to accommodate, you know, the people that will be doing the work for you and with you? Um, so again, doing JHAs and being involved in that more day-to-day -day sort of project uh, scale side of things is another consideration. You might also be the person who's providing the safety on site. You might be the only person who's got relevant first aid training. So again, uh, something to consider, you know, managing all of that, or at least being aware of it on site. What, what, who is providing that? Often drill crews have that too, or your other contractors will have that too, but it's something you really need to consider. 
Um, and culturally, if, if you're going to be the person on site who, especially if you're a small company, um, you, you might be the personification of your company's culture on site, uh, which means that there is a little bit of onus, and I'll be careful with that because obviously you're, you're not the boss, you're not the senior or, or the exploration manager or the MD, but there will be a certain onus for you to, to try at least to provide um, a psychologically safe environment for, for everyone who's working on your site. Um, so that they can engage with you and, and with everyone else who's working there so that if there's good information that needs to go back and forth then that happens on a, on a regular way but if there's you know negative information or, or difficulties that are encountered that that can be communicated as well and that no one's living in fear of, of being sent off site and sacked and no one's living in fear of, of then receiving a phone call of, of someone yelling at them rather fiercely at the other end so trying to promote that, and it won't, it won't be perfect, but trying to encourage that and promote that um, is a fantastic way to really facilitating all the, all the safety on site and making sure that you get support for um, the safety initiatives and just the actions that need to occur to make work go safely on your site. And, and finally, there is speak up, you know, or, always that important thing of don't, don't walk past the standard if you're not happy with it. That especially goes for safety. If there's a problem, speak up. You know, the, the terrible thing, if you're not happy, shut it down, then you have to do it. Here's a little one going back to plots. I've added this in there because I, um, I think it's relevant. Some of, this, some of the, um, the hazards and that, that, that are there might be really subtle and, and you might not notice them. This one is to do with fatigue. Um, you're probably wondering, oh my gosh, she's, she's put up another plod, this woman's mad, she's obsessed with plods. I am a little bit, um, unfortunately, at, the, at the, um, the site supervisor stage and at the, the superintendent stage, you do get a bit obsessed with plods. Um, what I want you to take note of here is the hours worked. So that, that's the total hours that undertook, so it's 12.75. Nominally, our work hours on site are 12. Obviously, this one we could fudge a little bit and say, well, it might have taken them a little bit of extra time to drive in and out. Maybe someone got a flat tire, those, those sort of things. But it's something to really keep an eye on, especially again, if it's really only you there or you, you camped sort of further away and then you've got, to, you've got to drive in and you're not necessarily in the same location as your drill crews or as the other contractors. Keep an eye on this sort of stuff because it's this sort of thing it's, that can creep up and, and become a fatigue issue, especially if it's long run. Like this, I'm not so worried about, but um, if it was going to be day after day, if those are 14 hour days, if there's, some, if there's things that, and it's continuous, then that's uh, an indicator that something's not quite right there. So plots can have more information on them than, you know, just the, just the, um, the regular, you know, nuts and bolts of how many metres you drilled. So I think, I think I'm going to get close to time or, or very close to it. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll wrap that up there and, um, and really just do a sort of a quick summary of um, you know, what, what we've covered. And it really was why, why did we need contractor management? Why, especially at this level, you know, where you might think, well, oh, it's a bit superfluous, gee whiz, that's what seniors are for, isn't that? We, we employ them to do that. Um, but no, really, you can do certain elements of it at, at this stage. And in fact, even at the, at the rig geo stage or that exploration geo, grad geo stage, you are doing some elements of contractor management. This is just building on those and giving you more tools to effectively manage and in more to the point, engage with the people that you're working with. That's, that's so key here. Um, <coughs> sorry. Again, key to engage and identify, first of all, and then engage with those contract partners so that the relationships that you've got uh, are there or, or you can form them and, and, and with those you've got a far better chance of, of getting the job you want done well uh, and, and also to the standard, you know, standard that you want and if there are problems along the way you've got the best chance of minimising or even just eliminating those because you'll, you'll nip them in the bud before they even occur. And we talked a little bit about your expectations and what you thought you should be doing in the role um, versus what your boss might think or what the company needs you to do. Um, and also what the contractor, you know, really needs from you to perform their role. You can't just march in there and go, all right, you, yeah, you know, look like you know what you're doing, go over there. If they need a bit of extra training, they definitely need inductions and they definitely need to be shown all your different site, site specifications so that they can do their job the best that, as, as best as they possibly can. Uh, and we talked about what your responsibilities were 
and they can fall into you know sort of a couple of different groups again it's not hard and fast there may be other things that your company wants you to do but this gives you an idea you know it definitely forms there's some sort of cultural obligation or definitely cultural responsibility to try and you know see how your attitude is see if you can modify it if you need to or or try and work with your contract partners as best you can um, there's definitely the legal one that's important again limited input but really important you understand the significance of all those all that um the, all those plods and all that work that's been done it has to be paid for somewhere and you want the best standard possible for your money that's really what it comes down to and of course there's the safety and making sure that um everyone on your site if you're in charge or at least the people you're working with are safe and including yourself um well that's probably about me actually um i've got i've got room for for, for um some discussion or some questions if uh, anyone anyone has any but otherwise i can hand it back over